Venezuela receives a large shipment of insulin from Russia. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister presses the opposition for calling for U.S. sanctions. I will bring you a report on how one South African village in Western Cape is facing COVID-19. Welcome to Telesur, I'm Carla Gonzalez, and this is From the South. Venezuela's Attorney General will be formalizing charges against the mercenaries and terrorists who have been captured over the course of the week. Prosecutor Tarek William Saab said that the Venezuelan citizens who are in custody will face charges of a conspiracy with a foreign government, and they'll be charged with terrorism, treason, arms trafficking, and association to commit crimes, alongside two U.S. citizens. 31 people have been arrested in total, including mercenaries and a support team. I would like to highlight that arrest orders have been solicited. Apart from these 22 against Venezuelan citizens Juan José Rendón and Sergio Vergara, as well against U.S. citizen Jorgan Godreau for their implication in the design, financing and execution of this criminal terrorist action against the territory, authorities and people of Venezuela. We will solicit their inclusion and a red alert within the system of Interpol. And obviously, we will request their extradition to Venezuela. Venezuela's Minister of Communication presented new details regarding the foil plot. The Washington Post published 42 pages of the contract signed by Jordan Goudreau of Civil Corp and J.J. Rendon. Interviews which have been given by, by Juan Guaidó's associates to media outlets in the United States are also being examined. The attempted incursion of U.S. mercenaries in Venezuela has called attention to undercover operations, terrorism and arms trafficking, which all fuel irregular warfare across the world. The private military contractor Silver Corp enlists its men as soldiers of fortune to take advantage of their military skills. Here. These guys mean business, Dan. How much would Jordan pay for the job? Um, I expected anywhere from 50 to 100,000. Denman, Luke Alexander. But for this former Marine, his tactical training in advanced infiltration wasn't enough to complete his mission, which was to secure an airfield in Caracas and kidnap President Nicolas Maduro in order to take him to the United States. My responsibilities to Silver Corps are written in a contract or described in a contract signed by Jordan Goudreau, Juan Rendon, and Juan Guaido. For the mercenaries, this contract was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, having as guarantee $212 million in Venezuelan funds and assets seized by the United States. Jordan Goudreau, representative of the U.S. company Silver Corp, said that he would be in charge of the supply of weapons and the training of three groups of military deserters. He also introduced us that day to two U.S. citizens, soldiers who would take care of training us in close quarters and combat in confined areas. For its part, the DEA, with one of its agents, put in place scenarios like these ones in popular areas of Caracas. Under threats, local drug traffickers set off a number of armed clashes with no casualties, as a distraction for the terrorist incursion. In a conversation that I had with Antonio Sequea Torres talking about my payment of $2 million for cooperating with the operation, he told me that I don't have to worry, that they are being financed by drug dealer Doble Rueda, relative of Marta Gonzalez, the wife of Cleaver Alcala. They were financing the paramilitary group, which was headed by United States citizens Harold Luke and Jordan. Since September, Venezuela has denounced in the United Nations the existence of three mercenary training camps in Colombia. The General Assembly approved in 1989 an international convention criminalizing the acts of recruiting, utilizing or financing mercenaries, practice being carried out in Colombia with mercenaries contracted for armed raids. 
a contract that the main strategist of opposition figure Juan Guaido admitted to signing and of personally paying $50,000 for. It was an exploratory operation to see the possibility of capturing and delivering to justice some members of the regime. It was a pact signed by Guaido. We've been working on the formation of this special unit for months for the liberation of Venezuela. El contrato para la invasión de Venezuela. This is a serious crime anywhere in the world. I hope to see justice. Donald Trump, the head of this incursion, they privatized this act. Que garantiza la justicia en Venezuela. Unlike Colombia and the United States, Venezuela is signatory since 2012 of the International Convention Against the Recruitment, Use, Financing and Training of Mercenaries. Rolando Segura, Telesur, Caracas, Venezuela. Russia-Venezuelan cooperation continues today as a shipment of 500,000 units of insulin arrives from Russia. That supply will be destined for the public hospital network. The Russian aircraft was received by the Minister of Health of Venezuela, Carlos Alvarado, who said that this newest load is the result of a strategic cooperation agreement signed last year between the two nations. As part of these agreements, Russia has sent 1.5 million doses of influenza vaccines and 30,000 PCR tests since the start of the year. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Let's continue with news. This Friday, St. Lucia will welcome 219 nationals as part of a repatriation process amid the pandemic. The country has recorded two more cases of COVID-19 after previously announcing the 100% recovery of 15 patients. St. Lucia has recorded a total of 18 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Two additional cases have recovered bringing to 17 the number of cases that have fully recovered and have been reintegrated into their communities. We now have one active case currently in hospital care and this individual is recovering well. On Friday, May 8, 2020, the Department of Health and Wellness will receive 219 St. Lucians who are cruise ship workers on the Carnival Glory and the Caribbean Princess. These passengers will be received and placed into quarantine for a period of 14 days as per the country's established protocol. 36 Jamaican students stranded in Barbados have been offered to be flown home by Fly One Caribbean Airlines. The company based in St. Vincent and the Grenadines said a repatriation flight could be facilitated once their home government agrees. This follows repeated requests to Jamaica by the University of the West Indies Jamaica must authorize the flight since its borders remain closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The UWI students say they are prepared to assume the costs. The Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago is pressing the opposition after its leader accused the government of allowing a U.S. sanctioned aircraft to land. Dr. Keith Rowley said the opposition is arguing that the country has broken international law in order to use that claim against them in the upcoming election. Today, the opposition leader of Trinidad and Tobago said something, which again was quite startling. She said that by that aircraft coming into Trinidad and Tobago, we have broken international law. I want to remind you all that while we are cognizant of the long arm of the United States and the power of its uh, activity against small states like ours and others. We know that the sanctions against Venezuela, they don't come from international law. They come from an executive order of the order of the United States. So for the opposition leader in Trinidad and Tobago to convert an American president executive order into international law, and calling on the Americans to beat up on Trinidad and Tobago because we have broken international law, because a sanctioned aircraft, something unknown to us, has flown into our territory. 
is really something that should cause us to ask just who is Kamala Prasad Bissasa working for? And because a plane that brought the vice president here has an American sanction that we didn't know about, you are going to call for sanction on people of Trinidad and Tobago. You are a traitor lady. With two new positives reported on Thursday, the Cayman Islands now has a total of 80 confirmed COVID-19 cases. There are 76 results in total, of which two are positive. Um, one of the positive people had a travel history and one is a contact of somebody that's previously been reported. That brings our total positive to 80. The number of symptomatic are nine. The number of asymptomatic are 33. The number of admitted remain unchanged at two and recovered at 35. From Monday to Friday for the next two weeks, businesses in St. Kitts and Nevis will be allowed to resume limited operations as the government moves to relax some of the measures implemented to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Businesses will not only have a five-day work week to operate, but an additional hour as well on each day of limited business operations. Please note, that the nightly curfew will continue and that it must be adhered to. Nightly curfew will now start at 8 p.m. and end an hour earlier at 5 a.m. the following day. Our medical experts have advised us that these additional hours at the start and the end of the day are important to allow not only for more economic activity but to allow for our citizens to get more engaged in exercise routines such as walking and jogging, as this is one of the ways we fight the COVID disease. And now we head to South Africa. The Western Cape is the hardest hit province by the coronavirus, with the highest number of cases concentrated in the city areas. Many small towns have so far escaped the virus, but with the lifting of travel restrictions, this might change soon. Johan Abrams reports from rural South Africa. At the start of this week, 4th of May, the Western Cape has reported a total of 3,044 cases. This is nearly half the number of cases in the country. It shows that the Cape is on a different trajectory than the rest of the country, and predictions are that it will be reaching its peak way ahead of the other provinces. It is estimated that the province may have to deal with more than 200,000 COVID-19 infections by July. This could mean that about 8,000 might require hospitalization, with more than 1,000 needing respirators. The question is, will the province be able to cope? The healthcare system of this province has always been in a good state. What we've been able to do with COVID is to raise our readiness to do this and be prepared for what's coming at us. We've also had very good cooperation with our private sector colleagues, and we're very close to having agreements that we will do this as a collective towards the peak of COVID. It is also interesting that most cases appear to be concentrated in and around the Cape Town city area, with relatively few cases reported in other municipalities. This is Grayton, a small sleepy village in the Tierwaterskloof municipality, just more than an hour's drive from the city centre. The economy of Grayton is totally dependent on tourism. Grayton Gnadenal is plus minus 600 bed, so in total on weekends we can more or less sleep 2,000 people. Um, but since lockdown, Grayton has now come to a standstill, uh, as we don't have any visitors coming into Grayton at this time. Peterson says many events, such as the annual classic music festival and the international mountain bike competition, the Cape Epic, had to be cancelled. Grayton is about 140 kilometres from Cape Town and there are no known cases of COVID-19 here, which many believe is a direct result of the strict lockdown regulations imposed by government. Johan Abrams for Telesur in Grayton, South Africa. And South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has chaired a virtual meeting with neighboring countries to discuss the joint response to COVID-19. In his opening remarks, 
Ramaphosa said while the number of infections is lower in Africa than elsewhere in the world, the peak is yet to come. He also lamented the lack of personal protective equipment and the negative effects of border closures on economies. Ramaphosa also said that five special envoys have been appointed to follow up on pledges, mobilize further international support and campaign for financial assistance from world leaders. Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane remains steadfast in his decision to retire by the end of July, announcing that steps have already been taken to ensure this occurs. Allow me to announce today that one significant step leading to my retirement has been complemented with the enactment of the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution. As a result, government and the political party that I lead will coordinate the process of my retirement. COVID-19 testing in Uganda has been extended for 10 more days after it was hampered by a lack of sufficient test kits and transport. The rapid tests were meant to be completed by May 4th. The American Tower Corporation has supported the Minister of Health with 345 million shillings to help in combating the spread of COVID-19. Uganda Virus Research Institute, a government entity at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic fight, is the main beneficiary of ATC financial support. We chose test kits in particular because it's the first step towards fighting this pandemic in order to test appropriately, confirm those who have the virus and those who don't have, in order to isolate those who need to be isolated in time. And since that's where there was a great need, and uh, uh, both, both in terms of the kits themselves being available, the high cost of the kits, we felt that is where we needed to channel our donation towards. ATC is the leading tower company in Uganda and is currently involved in delivering wireless communications and broadcast network infrastructure. Sometimes we have challenges with test kits. So donations towards test kits are highly valued by the Ministry of Health because it goes to support the core of the response. Relatedly, the Uganda Communication Commission has lauded the frontline agencies and the media in the fight against the spread of the contagion COVID-19. We would want to recognize and thank everybody. We know that it's been a sacrifice on everybody in terms of the individual and various people have really contributed in different ways. The media has really been extraordinary in this fight of COVID. Uh, making sure that people get good information, sensitize them, educate them, let us not get tired. This was during the handover of an assortment of personal protective equipment to the national COVID-19 response effort. Meanwhile, the Minister of Health has extended the rapid COVID-19 test for 10 more days. This was after the exercise was hampered by inadequacy of test kits and vehicles. And the testing is now going on. Yesterday, over 1,300 samples were run. Good enough, they were negative. But as you are aware, we already have four positives that the rapid assessment identified. One in Masindi, two in Chotera, and one in Rakai. The ministry is also deploying the GenX part machines to hasten the testing exercise of truck drivers at the borders. Turnaround time with the GenX part machines is a little shorter, basically one hour. And within our one hour, we can run a good number of samples. And so we think and we believe that because currently the areas of potential danger at the border points of entry, but also the communities living along the border areas. That was our report by CCTV. We'll be right back with more news. Thank you for joining us again. Two white men have been arrested and charged in the U.S. state of Georgia for the murder of 25-year-old African-American male Ahmad Arbery. On Thursday, ex-police officer Gregory McMichael and his son Travis were charged with murder and aggravated assault two months after the incident. 
Public pressure rose after a video was released showing Arbery being chased by a pickup truck and an armed man. Arbery, who was going for a jog, was shot three times after a scuffle. His attackers claimed they thought he was a robbery suspect. Arbery would have turned 26 this Friday. As, as all of you are, are aware by now, yesterday evening, agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation effectuated an arrest on two individuals, Greg and Travis McMichaels, charging them with both felony murder and aggravated assault in regards uh, to the killing of Ahmad Arbery back in February uh, of 2020 here in Glenn County. We became involved in this case late Tuesday evening, uh, approximately 9.30 or so, when we were formally requested to get involved and um, we hit the ground running pretty hard. In other news, various social sectors in Argentina are questioning the world capitalist system and its efficiency at responding to a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. They are also proposing a number of changes in order to create a new system for the benefit of all. For experts and political leaders from different parties, COVID-19 made evident the many pitfalls of the global economy. We need only take a look at what's happening in one of the richest cities in the world, New York. The devastation in the so-called richest countries highlights the failure of capitalism in all its forms and also the failure of those sectors that hoard our wealth. While many agree that most nations have responded as best as possible to the pandemic, they also highlight that most countries have limited resources and that it's necessary to tax the most wealthy. In the face of such an extreme situation, what we are seeing across the globe is that we need the richest sectors to provide significant support. How can we tax those who are begging for a plate of food or that person who can barely make ends meet? The real effort needs to come from those who can afford it. Economic groups and business owners have been the ones to benefit the most from neoliberal policies, like those of former President Mauricio Macri. Rodless capitalism brought us here. Capitalism breeds disasters, as we've seen with the environment and are now seeing with this virus. But the ones who suffer in the end are always the popular sectors, the workers. People are being laid off by the millions, salaries are being cut. There are millions of informal workers who've fallen into extreme poverty because they can no longer work. Experts propose that Argentina nationalize foreign trade as well as banks to avoid a massive loss of capital. Capital which could be used to combat the social crisis that has been worsened by the pandemic. This is an unjust system and needs to end. We need to prioritize health. We need a unified healthcare system and put an end to private clinics and private businesses to guarantee our people's health. We need a state that can provide for its people. Many agree that this is the time for radical change across the globe and to create a new system that redistributes wealth. Bolivia's Supreme Electoral Court is working on setting a date for the delayed presidential elections, which were supposed to take place last weekend. We have more on this report. The head of Bolivia's Supreme Electoral Court, Salvador Romero, has announced that the organization is working to comply with a recently approved law which calls for elections to be held between June 28th and August 2nd. This topic is being discussed and we will carry out all necessary evaluations, be it operational or logistical, to figure out what are the best conditions for us to preserve the public's health, not only for voters or on the day the ballot is held, but in all activities leading up to the date. Speaking with Telestor over social media, the head of the electoral court said that an additional budget will be needed for biosecurity for voters and for all involved in the election process. He also said that restarting the electoral process was the court's initiative. This bill by the Legislative Assembly was the result of a dialogue process, of deliberation with representatives from the eight parties running for office. Our court presented the proposal to the Assembly after extensive work. The de facto regime and its candidate, Janine Añez, have continuously placed a distant third place in most polls and has been highly critical of the National Assembly's law, which requires that the elections be held within 90 days.
We've established a 90-day deadline, and the head of the electoral court has been very understanding and has agreed to comply with the law. Experts are monitoring the spread of the coronavirus, and we will consider their suggestions to even possibly expand the time frame. Eight candidates are in the running for Bolivia's top office, hoping to bring the nation back into democratic order following last November's successful coup against President Evo Morales. Seven of those candidates are from the right-wing sectors, unable to present a united front against the movement towards socialism, which remains in first place in voter intention surveys. And with that, we end our news brief. But you can find these and more stories on our website, telesurenglish.net. And if you can, stay home. We'll keep you updated. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Until next time.